Okay, well, I think we'll start. Uh, there may uh, be more people joining up as, uh, as we go, but I think we've got, we're on a tight timeline uh, from 11 till uh, 12 noon. So welcome everyone to panel one of our six session webinar series on the future of UN peacekeeping, launched on Thursday, Thursday evening with a keynote address from a former head of UN peacekeeping, Jean-Marie Guéhenot. In that keynote, he outlined some of the huge challenges confronting UN peace, the UN peacekeeping enterprise of stabilization, democratization, and justice. Given the experience in the DRC, the Central African Republic, and Darfur, given Security Council fragmentation, and perhaps most daunting, given the fact that every conflict now is potentially a political flashpoint between great powers. But Gehino was nonetheless optimistic, urging us to recalibrate expectations for UN peacekeeping and focus on the core political mission of rebuilding trust between citizens and their governments. Today, we turn to panel one, which within the overall theme of the evolution of UN peacekeeping and how that informs our approach to current challenges, will look at successes and failures and lessons learned. Following presentations by each of our two panelists, whom I will have the pleasure of introducing shortly, we will take up questions that participants that you can pose by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. You can do this while the, key, while the presentations are being delivered, as well as during the question time itself. You can also click the like button for questions other than your own, and this will move them up the list. And now for the introductions. Lise Morey Howard is a professor of government at Georgetown University in Washington, DC although she is speaking to us today from Paris. Her research and teaching interests span the fields of international relations, comparative politics, and conflict resolution. In her award-winning 2008 book, UN Peacekeeping in Civil Wars, Lise Howard studies the sources of success and failure in UN peacekeeping. Her in-depth analysis of some of the most complex UN peacekeeping missions debunked the then conventional wisdom that these missions habitually fail. In her latest book published in 2019 entitled Power in Peacekeeping, Howard examines how peacekeepers exercise power to achieve their UN mandated goals. It is based on more than two decades of study, interviews with peacekeepers, unpublished records and on-site observation. Lise Howard also regularly publishes timely, incisive articles on civil war termination, peacekeeping, and American foreign policy. A member of EPON, the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network, she contributed to their latest hot off the presses report on MINUSCA, the UN mission in the Central African Republic, and she will reference that study in her presentation. I noted as an aside that there is a Canadian member of EPON, the Bassley School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Ontario. Our second speaker, Richard Gowan, is the UN Director for the International Crisis Group, overseeing all their advocacy work at the United Nations, liaising with diplomats and UN officials in New York. For those who tuned in Thursday evening, you will recall that our keynote speaker, Jean-Marie Guéhenot was not only the head of UN peacekeeping, but following that, the head of the International Crisis Group. And for those of you who follow the blog of the organization I represent, the Rideau Institute, you will be aware of the extremely broad reach of the Crisis Group with ad active conflict resolution efforts relating to all the major conflicts ongoing today. Richard Gowan brings experience as broad as the scope of his remit at the United Nations. He has worked with the European Council on Foreign Relations, the New York University Center on International Cooperation, and the Foreign Policy Center in London, has taught at Columbia and Stanford, and has been a consultant for the UN Department of Political Affairs and the UN Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on International Migration, to name but two, as well as for a broad range of foreign ministries, 
including those of the UK, Finland, and Canada. His, his areas of expertise include the UN system, the Security Council, peacekeeping, and, and early warning and conflict prevention. I am sure our audience will agree that we have two exciting and eminently qualified speakers to address questions like the strength and limits of UN peacekeeping against the backdrop of as turbulent and challenging a time for the U United Nations as perhaps we have ever seen. Uh, Lee, ladies and gentlemen, I give you first Professor Lee's Morier, Morier Howard. Thank you so much, Peggy. Um, Thank you to the Rideau Institute and thank you, Sarah Bulls of the Group of 78. And thank you, Richard Gowan. It's always lovely to see you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm, I'm actually gonna share a PowerPoint. I, I uh, what can I say? I'm just a professor and that's, it's easier for me to do this um, by walking through. So I wanna talk today about uh, a few things. The, the thing with peacekeeping is that it always seems like it's not working, it, especially if you're looking at it from the inside and if you're reading the headlines and the newspapers, the thing, what, what gets reported is what makes the news are, is, are the disasters. That's just the way it is. That's what sells, that's what people are interested in. We all know that we're in this crazy echo chamber now of outrage. Um, and I will also say that coming off of several years of doing research, uh, both in the Central African Republic and on MINUSCA, um, that that mission is, it has its problems. All of the big five missions, soon to be big four, of course, have uh, a, lot, a lot of issues. Um, but I will also say that if we look broadly, at the relationship between peacekeeping and civilian deaths. So asking this question, are peacekeepers protecting civilians? Are they achieving their first and most important, arguably the most important of their uh, dimension of their mandates of protect, protecting civilians? The, the answer, the statistical answer is an overwhelming yes. So I wanna first talk about that relationship talk a bit about sexual exploitation and abuse and sexual and gender-based violence. Some other findings, I will note that we're looking at a two-thirds success rate of the completed peacekeeping missions and talk just a moment about my book and then just the main takeaway that I want to um, present that I want us to think about. So in terms of the relationship between peacekeeping and civilian deaths, we have 14 and counting studies, many that have just come out in the last year or two, that all show the same relationship between the presence of UN peacekeepers and redu a reduction in civilian deaths. And these are researchers at different universities in different institutions. They have different funding streams, different agendas. They're using different data sets. They're measuring in their models. They're using every control you can imagine. And not all of these studies are about the rela this relationship, but they all find that there is this important relationship that all else equal if you look at where peacekeepers are not compared to where they are, both within countries and, in, and across civil wars, we have less people dying where there are UN peacekeepers. We also see this interesting phenomenon, which is that the more diversity in peacekeeping missions uh, the more effective they are at preventing deaths. And that is kind of a puzzle. And the way some researchers are answering it is by saying, well, peacekeepers complement each other. And it's actually helpful that not everybody can functions as a military, um, as military units, but rather as peacekeepers, I'll come back to this idea. Um, we also have a finding, and all of these studies are in the top journals in, in political science. I will note that the American Political Science Review is the top journal in my field. Um, doesn't publish very often on peacekeeping, but this is one of the, a fairly recent study of showing that peacekeepers course correlate with fewer military deaths. Now, in terms of sexual abuse and there is undoubtedly and indisputably still a problem in UN peacekeeping of sexual abuse and exploitation. It is something that the UN is trying to work on. Uh, it is not easy. Um, 
And I want to talk about this for just a moment. So uh, relate these two things. Um, we know that the more UN peacekeepers we have, the less sexual and gender-based violence we see during civil war. We have two studies in top journals that, are show, that show this relationship in different ways. So peacekeepers are not only saving people from death, they're also saving people from sexual and gender-based violence. That said, the more UN peacekeepers we have, the greater risk of transactional sex. In other words, more prostitution. Peacekeepers mean more prostitution. Um, there's a fabulous study of Liberia that shows that um, the, Peacekeepers increase the risk that women will engage in their first experience of transactional sex. And then we also see that um, more broadly across peacekeeping missions, more sex trafficking where you see UN peacekeepers. So uh, again, as I mentioned, this, this is a problem. Um, we also know that the more women in peacekeeping, the less sexual abuse and exploitation we have committed by peacekeepers. Um, that is not to lay this the solution of this entire problem on women in peacekeeping, but it is to say that there is this relationship between the two. Um, yeah, the last thing I would want to do is, is lay this all at the doorstep of women, but, but we also see that women can make things better. Okay, some other findings. Peacekeepers prevent the spread of violence within countries and across borders. Um, so, Civil wars tend to spread across borders. They tend to spread within countries. When we have UN peacekeepers there, there's less of that. Um, they also help to keep the peace once it's ended. So they reduce the recurrence of civil wars. Civil wars tend to recur once they've stopped. Um, peacekeepers also reduce the length of civil wars. And we have a lot of old scholarship and new, newer scholarship showing this relationship. This is, a question that a lot of researchers are addressing right now, do peacekeepers produce better post-conflict institutions? And so far the answer is, uh, is yes. Um, we see better uh, policing, better um, judicial institutions, improvements, I would say. Not, nothing is hunky-dory. We're not looking at a whole bunch of great, beautiful democracies once peacekeepers leave. Um, but it's also very hard not to notice if you've been in, in DRC or in the Central African Republic in the last few years, um, there, there is a civil society. It's growing and it's robust and it's not something that was there before. And it's, it's something that exists in a way that doesn't exist in the countries where there aren't UN peacekeepers now. So that is an unintended consequence of the presence of UN peacekeepers. Um, turning to, so th those are mainly findings when peacekeepers are deployed. If we look more broadly at the rate of success and failure of completed peacekeeping missions, so of the, of the um, 16 completed peacekeeping missions of the big complex ones, the UN has implemented its mandates in about set in 11 and left. And I will just note in, a, in, a, in contrast with a snarky comment that um, counterinsurgency, which of course is very different from peacekeeping, right? Counterinsurgency success rates have been declining for the last hundred years. It's not just that um, it's not been going well in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's, it hasn't been going well for a really long time, counterinsurgency, which of course is very different from peacekeeping, right? So peacekeepers have this three-part doctrine, um, consent of the, of the parties, impartiality, and uh, the non-use of force except in self-defense and in defense of the mandate. And counterinsurgency, of course, takes sides. They use a lot of force and they're not um, impartial uh, or, or operating with consent. So these are the 11 missions that have been concluded. And as I said before, a, a, lo a lot of these countries are still struggling with democracy. It's not like everyone has transitioned completely, but at the same time, um, by every measure are, uh, by, uh, by pretty much every measure are doing, are faring better than they were when the civil war was raging. I will also note that increasingly we see a trend of UN peacekeeping missions uh, successfully co-deployed with other military forces. Co sometimes we see military forces uh, deploying before, sometimes it's during, um, but we see this, 
uh, division of labor shaping up and sometimes it's working quite well. And I want to dig into that for just a moment and I'm keeping track of my time. Um, and I will just note our failed missions, right? So I noted the 11 successful missions, our five failed missions. Whenever we talk about peacekeeping, we tend to talk about the failures. I will also note that since the genocide in Bosnia in 1995, 25 years ago, we have not had another peacekeeping mission deployed where there's a genocide happening under the noses of the peacekeepers. In other words, we have not had this recur and I uh, would engage in the counterfactual and hypothesize that in the Central African Republic, we very well could have had a genocide had UN peacekeepers not been deployed. Okay, so how do peacekeepers achieve their ends? How do they um, exercise power? This is the argument of my book, my new book that I will shamelessly plug right now. Um, anyway, so the, here's the book. It's about how peacekeepers exercise power. And I'm working with this old, uh, I don't know, I guess I could say it, call it a classic definition of power, which is when A has the power to convince B to do something that he or she would not otherwise do. And I'm arguing that peacekeepers exercise power. They convince the peacekeep the peace kept to move on in peaceful means by three main ways. Um, they are persuading using non-material means. They induce with financial incentives or taking things away, so restricting markets and arms and in, in other in trafficking. Um, and they also exercise coercion, but not compellence, they don't exercise the offensive use of force. And sometimes they do, um, sometimes they try, but that's not how peacekeeping is designed. So I want to contrast, um, uh, make a quick contrast with the Central African Republic. And we see here the Sangaris uh, French uh, forces who um, for a couple of years in the Central African Republic were deployed. And we see that they are driving in military vehicles. They don't have any blue or white on them. And they were capable of inflicting harm on people who were attacking civilians. So when civilians were attacked, Sangaris had a very limited mandate and that was to counterattack. And we just see what they look like. They, you know, they're they're quite menacing looking. So they're practicing compellence or or they they exercise power through their military capacity um, to engage in offensive uses of force. And this is another picture of, of the Sangaris from, from Bangui. Uh, also in Bangui, we see um, this is, for example, a Rwandan peacekeeper. In, in an armed personnel carrier, right? So visually, peacekeepers look very different from traditional military forces. And so it's, it, this is a, um, the symbols of white and blue are symbolizing a, a different purpose, right? A different way of engaging, of exercising power. And here, um, this peacekeeper is, is defending the parliament. So defending something is much easier um, the, the military requirements for defending something are not as substantial as engaging in the offensive use of force. So you can protect buildings, you can protect people, protecting civilians, um, also engaging in the power of arrest. Um, MINUSCA very famously was uh, ha has arrest powers unlike the other big missions right now. And I will note that um, the original force commander of peace of the whole mission, uh, the mission was originally under police control and there is the, the first commander there and there I am photobombing the picture and there is my um, journalist friend and guide who is helping me navigate a tricky situation in the Central African Republic. I will note that armed groups control uh, about 80% of the territory. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult place for everybody who lives there and for outside researchers who are trying to understand what's going on. Um, so we see peacekeepers surveilling. Um, they're surveilling, they're watching, they're trying to keep track of what's going on. Um, and I will note right here um, at the death rates. So we saw the spike, Central African Republic has not been a particularly violent place through most of its history. Um, it hasn't, it, they've had 
non-peaceful transfers of power, but nothing like what happened in 2013 with the violence um, in 2013. And so we saw the UN, this map traps, tracks pretty quickly with the arrival of French Sangaris forces, they quelled the violence, the arrival of the UN peacekeeping mission in September 2014, the successful of division of labor. So French special French forces exercising compellence, hitting back whenever somebody would hit civilians, and then UN peacekeepers helping to build institutions and working on political processes and fostering local peace committees, local peace processes. Now they have this two-part um, peace process, so working from the bottom up and from the top down. But I will note that the French forces left here, um, uh, they, they left in September of 2016, and we saw the violence spike um, dramatically upon their departure. And only, and with great difficulty, the mission has been figuring out how to bring those violence levels back down without, without um, this assistance. So just to summarize, peacekeeping has been effective, even though we have this idea that it doesn't really work. If you look statistically, it's kind of working. Um, Peacekeepers exercise power through some forms of coercion, but not compellence, not the offensive use of force. They also induce and they persuade using non-material means, using the primacy of politics is what we like to talk about, primacy of the political. When we see a clear division of labor between peacekeepers and regular military forces, we see some success in mandate implementation. And I just want to note that peacekeeping is pretty cheap. And given our other alternatives, which would be a lot more deaths, it is absolutely a worthy investment. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very, very much um, for that, you know, that clear look, clear eyed look at uh, where the UN succeed, succeeds, what some of the factors are that contribute to that success and um, what some of the challenges are. And now, um, and, and right on, right on time as well. And so I'll turn immediately to our to our second speaker, speaking from New York City, Richard Gallen. Uh, well, thank you very much, Peggy. Um, it's great to to join you, and um, great to follow Lise, who has, um, I think, set out very clearly uh, the the strong case um, for peacekeeping as an international crisis management tool. Um, what I'm going to do uh, is primarily actually summarize uh, some comments on the state of peace operations from my crisis group colleagues in the field. Um, as Pe Peggy said, crisis group is an international conflict prevention organization with uh, about 150 staff worldwide, and we have staff uh, working directly uh, often in close cooperation with the UN in countries like um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, the Sudans, um, and Mali. So uh, we see peacekeeping close up um, on the ground uh, on a daily basis. And actually earlier this year, just on the cusp of the pandemic, um, I was asked to give a briefing to um, Jean-Marie Gehenno's uh, successor, um, the under Secretary General for Peacekeeping on what Crisis Group was seeing and reporting about peacekeeping on, on the ground. And I'm going to uh, tell you some of the headlines that I told um, uh, the, the UN Secretariat back in the spring. Uh, clearly, since the spring, uh, the world has changed a bit um, and the world of peacekeeping has changed a bit. Um, and peacekeepers have had to respond to the challenges and restrictions of COVID like everyone else. And so I, I will also talk a little about how the UN has handled those challenges, which I think has broadly actually been a positive story. Um, so I, I, do, I do want to emphasize that. Before getting into that on the ground perspective, though, I just wanted to pick up on something uh, that struck me in your opening remarks, um, Peggy. You said that um, uh, you know, one of the sources of turbulence for peacekeeping today um, is the increasingly divisive nature of the Security Council. 
Um, and I actually want to push back a little bit on that um, because uh, the Security Council is increasingly divided um, and uh, you know, the geopolitical picture for the UN is not promising. But something that I find quite interesting is that actually that hasn't had a huge impact on the Council's oversight of peace operations uh, in Africa, which is where um, the vast majority of Blue Helmet operations are deployed. I mean, if you look at the Security Council today, uh, you actually really have almost two separate worlds of diplomacy. Um, you have highly contentious um, and tragically, uh, I know, tragically ineffectual um, diplomacy amongst the, the big powers over um, first order geopolitical crises. And you know, for 10 years now, we have uh, watched the Security Council um, fail to uh, deal with the situation in Syria. Um, the Security Council is struggling with the situation in Libya, which directly involves um, France and Russia in particular. Um, the Security Council is barred from dealing with uh, Venezuela um, uh, because the US does not want the Council to, to engage down there and orders China and Russia. And the list goes on. Um, uh, Myanmar is a case where China has increasingly uh, strangled serious Security Council diplomacy in recent years. You can find cases, obviously, where um, a first order crisis is still on the UN agenda. Afghanistan is one, but it is increasingly rare. And what we've seen in the last year in particular is that tensions over issues um, around COVID um, are, are starting to poison uh, Chinese US uh, discussions in New York. So it's it's a very grim picture, and you know, to be quite honest, Canada may have been a bit lucky not to get a seat on the Security Council because um, you would have found yourself in a bit of a mess. Um, the good news, though, and there is good news, is that these these fights just don't seem to affect the way that the P five and other council members address peacekeeping um, on the African continent. And actually, uh, there's a sort of but a carve out, I would say, um, amongst the P5 by which they have agreed um, that when it comes to Africa, UN operations, sometimes um, in coordination with the African Union, remain in everyone's interests. And so diplomacy over the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, is remarkably uncontentious. Um, we did a lot of work last year uh, on DRC. Um, with um, Security Council experts. And you could have very, very constructive discussions in which the Russians and Chinese uh, would be engaging very substantively and very collegially with their counterparts from Western countries. And that is because no one sees um, the DRC um, or South Sudan as a, uh, you know, as a geopolitical um, flashpoint. Um, the Central African Republic ironically, is a slight exception to that um, because uh, Russia has um, become a bit embroiled in the CAR, um, sending uh, a pri private military personnel um, and weapons to CAR. And that has created some friction with the French. Um, and at one point, I think the Russians actually refused to support um, a resolution renewing the mandate for MINUSCA because of those tensions. But even there, everyone has agreed to keep um, keep the situation under control. Uh, in part, I think, because again, the Russians have worked out that CAR is a pretty difficult place to operate and they don't really want to get into a big fight with France over it. Um, so I, I just wanted to make this point that peacekeeping is an area of cooperation that has survived remarkably well in a period of broader geopolitical competition. Um, I. I also recently wrote something which I'm going to send to all panelists now on China's approach to peacekeeping, where again we see more cooperation than, than competition with the West. Um, where geopolitical competition has, I think, affected the peacekeeping landscape um, has been in the cases like Ukraine, um, where there has been serious discussion of a peacekeeping force in Donbass. Uh, but simply P5 tensions mean that that has not become a reality. So 
um, when we're talking about peacekeeping being an area of cooperation, we're mainly talking about peacekeeping in Africa. Okay, so that's, that's the good news from the Security Council. Um, what do we see on the ground? And what, what do our, um, our colleagues in the field uh, tell us about the state of peace operations? Now, here I'm afraid the picture is, is not quite so rosy. Um, I think that we are in a, a difficult phase of UN peace operations um, by which uh, the UN has succeeded and I think probably outperformed expectations, um, as, as Lee said, uh, in uh, completing missions more or less successfully in uh, places like Liberia, um, East Timor, uh, Cote, Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, you know, Kosovo, um, uh, it, you know, is, is not quite complete, but basically Kosovo was a success story for the UN. Um, by contrast, where the UN is left um, are very big countries, um, DRC, uh, the Sudans, uh, with very limited infrastructure, uh, very limited inf institutions. And um, I think, you know, these cases are especially difficult ones. And in Mali, which is another you know, gigantic country where Canada was deployed quite recently, you have the additional challenge of uh, jihadi forces who have made peacekeepers targets. So we're looking at some awfully tough operational environments um, and operational environments in which uh, it's often hard, I think, for the UN to see how to create political settlements um, that will last and um, provide a framework for, uh, for, a, for a UN exit. Uh, even in uh, Sudan, Darfur, where the UN has been working towards an exit, that keeps on being delayed and held up, actually, because of the changing political environment. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a problematic time. We're dealing with, we're dealing with some of the hardest cases um, for, for peace operations. Uh, now secondly, a, a big problem that the UN faces in many of these cases is that uh, despite having troops on the ground, it's not actually um, playing a lead role in political discussions about the future of the country. And I think uh, Jean-Marie Gehano emphasized that peacekeepers should focus on politics. Um, actually, in many cases, uh, various actors are working very hard to ensure that UN peacekeepers don't play a big role in national mediation um, and, and peace processes. So in South Sudan, for example, it's regional powers um, that guide uh, political talks in most cases. Um, in uh, the, the DR Congo, the UN used to have a very significant political role but it has been marginalized um, over the years. And it's actually, again, uh, regional players like Angola that um, sort of are often working on the, the difficult polit political issues behind the scenes, um, leaving the UN with a significant operational presence, but much less of a, of a political presence. And that, I think, is, is, uh, makes life very difficult for the UN because in somewhere like South Sudan, you have responsibility for saving lives, you have responsibility for protecting civilians, but you're not at the center of political discussions uh, with the, the leadership in, in, in Juba um, about how to resolve the overall problems in the country. And that means that the UN is, is left stuck trying to protect the vulnerable, but can't always see, see a way out. Um, a second problem that we see uh, related to the size and, as I say, poor infrastructure of um, many of the countries we're dealing with is that actually UN forces uh, just do not have the reach to protect civilians um, in many areas of violence. And so in, uh, in South Sudan, for example, uh, the peacekeeping force has been very effective at protecting civilians who fled to its bases and have been in some cases on its um, compounds for many years after the uh, beginning of the civil war. But the UN lacks the reach to patrol, to protect people living outside its bases in many cases. And um, you know, there've been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, there've been a lot of cases of, of, of mass killings in, in South Sudan, um, despite the fact that the UN is in the country. Similarly, Lee's pointed out that in the Central African Republic, 
um, you know, the UN is a significant player in um, Bangui, the capital, but armed groups control 80% of the country. So when, once you get outside the capital and outside some other centers, the UN's um, reach it remains quite limited in, in security terms. In, in Mali, uh, this situation, as I say, has been heavily exacerbated by the presence of jihadis. And in northern Mali, uh, which is where the majority of, of the UN force is focused, um, a lot of the UN's work is simply about protecting its own people. Um, there was a report a couple of uh, years ago that said that um, the peacekeepers in Mali were devoting about 90% of their efforts to protecting their own bases and convoys from jihadi attacks. So that leaves very little time uh, and very little military capacity for actually protecting civilians. So I think the historical record that Lee set out is right. Peacekeepers do overall reduce fatalities. Um, and I think in the Central African Republic case, yeah, peacekeepers did stop a genocide, but there's still a heck of a lot of violence and fatalities going on around peacekeeping operations at present. The last major problem um, that my colleagues in the field highlighted is that in many of the countries where the UN is involved, there's a lot of localized violence um, that is often extremely difficult to understand for outside interveners. And this is something which um, other academics that uh, Lisa and I know well, like Severino Tessa, have been emphasizing for a long time. I mean, in the Eastern Congo, you have an, an astonishing web of armed groups. You have an astonishing web of intercommunal violence. And, um, you know, the UN, which tends to come in focusing on trying to sort of provide overall stability, often struggles to deal with these pockets of localized violence um, that, are, uh, uh, so that, fl that are flourishing around it. There are some exceptions to this in South Sudan despite being cut out of the national political dialogue in many cases, the UN has done quite well on local peace building in some areas. It's actually, I mean, it's actually focused its attention down to dealing with grassroots violence. Um, but in other cases like, like the Eastern Congo, it, it hasn't managed to do that. Um, and, and the ongoing violence in those regions um, does harm the UN's local credibility. So those are the, the challenges we, we see right now. And of course, finally, there is uh, the overarching challenge of COVID. And just, just two minutes on COVID before I close. When COVID hit um, globally in, uh, in March, um, the UN immediately stopped rotating its peacekeepers um, and placed some pretty significant restrictions on what peacekeepers could do on the ground. Soldiers and police were instructed to maintain social distancing and avoid any contacts with communities that would risk transmission. And what was on everyone's mind um, in that situation was actually Haiti, because you will recall that about 10 years ago, um, a Nepali uh, unit, a Blue Helmet Nepali unit, deployed to um, Haiti. Uh, there were very, very poor um, preparations made for their, their sanitation, and that unit um, basically uh, gave cholera to the people of Haiti. And the UN has always tried to avoid this because it wants to avoid a discussion of liability, but it is a known fact that the peacekeepers brought cholera to Haiti. Now, what everyone was terrified of back in March was that you would have a situation where a, a UN peacekeeping force would bring COVID. Uh, to a conflict affected area. And there was a lot of rumors, for example, in South Sudan, on South, South Sudanese social media, that actually the UN was spreading COVID in the country. So uh, the UN pulled back, held tight. Um, and I think that has affected its ability to operate in a lot of countries because it just isn't able to patrol um, and deal with local communities uh, to the extent that it was before. Um, the good news is that although there have been clusters of, of COVID in some peace operations, like the one in Mali, I, I don't think there is any case now where you could say we've had a Haiti incident. Um, the UN does not actually happily bear responsibility for spreading the disease. Secondly, um, I think it's actually to the credit of the countries that deploy on UN peacekeeping missions that um, they have kept up these deployments. And actually, I think uh, NATO countries slightly increased their deployments or at least their uh, forms of support to UN peace operations during this period. There's been an understanding that despite the global uh, pandemic, it's necessary to keep UN peacekeeping going. And moving forward, I think we know there are going to be huge financial challenges 
um, for peacekeeping, which remains a $6 billion industry. But back in June, the UN General Assembly basically waved through a $6 billion budget um, for existing operations with very, very few cuts, despite the fact that everyone is very concerned about uh, their own national budgets at this time. So that maybe is, in a sense, a positive health check for UN peacekeeping. For all its problems, um, it has navigated the crisis of COVID about as well as we could have expected. And that makes some, you know, that again brings me back to my initial point, which is that peacekeeping does still seem to be an area where big countries, small countries, troop, tr troop contributing countries, countries that pay the bills still want to cooperate um, at a time when increasingly no one seems to want to cooperate on anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, um, and I have to say that uh, 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 our keynote, uh, Ambassador Geheno, did uh, talk about this fragmentation of the UN Security Council. But like you, he, he, he emphasized that uh, mandates were being renewed and that there was cooperation. Uh, on on still cooperation on UN peacekeeping and and I think that that really speaks to um, that that speaks to the basic truth that they they understand that there isn't another alternative that can do better and so 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 that is very encouraging but he also and you've provided much more detail on he also highlighted these other problems that are undermining the reasons why UN peacekeeping um, uh, has been successful as as Lee's told us about and that is um, you ha had uh, that undercut uh, the political resolution of the issues under underpinning uh, the conflict and regional actors pushing out the UN when uh, they have agendas of their own as do the uh, and uh, them pushing out the UN doesn't mean that they can better resolve these bigger issues and so. And so those are those are really uh, questions that I hope we can dig into a bit uh, a bit more um, uh, in uh, not only in discussion time but also in our further in our further panels. And um, uh, on the COVID one, I just wondered whether or not um, I'll, I'll, I'm unconscious of the time, so perhaps I'll, I'll wait and see if we have time after going to the questions from the audience because I have a COVID related question. Um, as to whether or not the uh, mission, uh, the presence of the mission in some ways enabled um, information uh, sharing that might have been helpful to the governments in question in responding. But, uh, you know, I just lay that out, but I think I want to turn now to the questions that we've got from our audience. And um, the first uh, question uh, is, directed, um, is directed specifically uh, to Professor Howard, but of course, Richard, if you want to chime in as well. Uh, thank you, Professor Howard. It has been very emotional hearing support for peacekeeping because as a former peacekeeper, I've been exposed to mostly the negative comments and worried if it, if it was even worth being in the field. I have a quick question. What can be done to measure the successes better and communicate these successes better to the general public? which usually has a very negative opinion of what the UN is doing. Um, you did allude to that briefly in one of your slides, Professor Howard, so I turn that question to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Anya Victory, for that question. And thank you also for your service to UN Peacekeeping, especially. Um, it's, uh, it's so, um, it, it's always per perplexing to me, actually, why, it's not always perplexing, but it is sometimes. Um, uh, surprising to me why the UN is not able to communicate or, or defend itself a little bit better. But on the other hand, it doesn't have, I think Richard has actually made this argument, it doesn't have a natural constituency in US politics or in anywhere, right? So, um, and I think when their spokespeople talk about their successes, I mean, it sounds like disinformation. It almost sounds like the Trump administration talking about their success. I mean, I shouldn't say that. Never mind. Erase that last sentence. But anyway, it sounds like disinformation. It sounds like what what are they talking about? We know that this is not working. And and so I'm always finding this huge disconnect between what the data show, which is 
impartial, right? It's And all of these researchers just want to publish a significant finding, a robust finding. They don't care what the finding is. You just want it to be robust because that's how you publish your article and advance your career. And a lot of the titles of the articles suggest that actually it probably isn't working. And then you look at the at the regression tables and there it is. It's, it's again and again, it's the same story. It's really weird. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I think it's because the UN doesn't have a natural constituency. There is no obvious con constituency and certainly, you know, people who are being protected by peacekeepers have, have a lot of, of other important things on their hands other than, you know, defending the UN protecting their lives. So um, maybe that's a part of what's going on. And then you also, you, you asked another question. I wonder if we can just talk about that one. To measure success uh, better. To, to measure success better. Um, oof, there, that, I just tried to measure it almost every way you can possibly imagine. There's a 310 page book about measuring success and failure by Paul Deal and, um, Deal and, and John, uh, David Druckmann, Deal and Druckmann anyway. Um, it's, it's something that researchers think about a lot. How, what are the best ways to measure success and failure? So I just presented a, a few of them. Um, and it's always interesting to talk about how, how we measure success. I, I tend to think that if we, I, I like to think about measuring success once the mission is finished, right? Did, did the peacekeepers implement their mandate and leave a country that's doing okay? And we see that about two thirds of the time, that is what's happening. Um, it's not to say that it's perfect, but it is to say it's kind of working out. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I don't, Richard, do you want to chime in or? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say, um, pivoting off, off what Lise just said, um, I, I think I was quoted in Foreign Policy saying something this week, which I'm gonna say again which is the problem for the UN is that its failures are dramatic and its successes are mundane. Um, or at least they seem mundane because uh, we've got quite used to what the UN can achieve. So, you know, exactly as Lee said, what do good peacekeeping operations produce? Um, countries that are still not perfect democracies, um, you know, are still not uh, Denmark or Switzerland, um, but are more cohesive, have better institutions um, than would otherwise be the case. But as very, very few people um, sort of really dig into the quality of institutions in Haiti or, or Liberia, that, that gets missed. By contrast, when you have a Srebrenica or when you have a significant spike of violence in the Eastern DRC, that's very easy to see. And I think that's, so that's sort of the, the, the big problem. I think it's also worth saying that uh, another point is that sometimes, you know, the Security Council members, one of the reasons they continue to work on peacekeeping operations is because they see these operations as a way to keep problems down, not necessarily to solve them. I know that coming back to the, the Central African case um, that we've discussed a lot today, I think one French ambassador in CAR told, uh, a senior UN official a few years ago, that his instruction from Paris was to keep CAR off the radar. Because the, what Paris did not want to do was have another major crisis where it would have to send a French intervention force to back up the UN. And to be quite honest, I think that is also uh, what we've been seeing in Mali for a while, what we've been seeing maybe in South Sudan. Um, you know, governments actually don't really back these operations um, because they think it's going to sort of like create perfect outcomes. They back, they back them because they want these problems off the radar. Um, and that also means that it's harder to tell success stories because really, you know, missions are being set up to, to manage but not resolve the problems that they're dealing with. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that. I, I'm going to abuse my role as moderator and jump in on this because there are, of course, agendas at play at well, as well. And in the Canadian case for a very, very long time, we had quite a sort of, we had an even balance as it were between that part of the Canadian military establishment uh, 
that saw peacekeeping as an extremely important activity and the uh, and that part that saw interoperability with the US as the key uh, aim and uh, that there was a tension there and over time I I regret to say that I think that the 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 robust military uh, versus uh, being seen as a as a UN peacekeeper has has gained in sway but this battle has meant that there are very strong constituencies in Canada in think tanks um, that that will that will jump and will trumpet what they perceive as any mistake in UN peacekeeping, and so there's a very loud voice on that side. And unfortunately, you add into that the um, the fact that the media obviously is going to be more interested in sensational negative often than than the mundane successes, as Richard has said. So um, that's part of the issue of the UN peacekeeping operations not having a natural constitu constituency, but military establishments having having allowed having a loud voice, and sometimes that's turned against uh, UN peacekeeping. Very short sighted, but and happily, there's been some change in that in Canada as Canada has started to reengage, albeit too slowly. Now I have another. I have a question about budgets. Um, uh, can Professor Howard explain a bit more about peacekeeping being cheap while the budgets are being slashed? And, and yes, I would, I, I would welcome this question because uh, that's a good news story about the cost effectiveness of UN peacekeeping that just doesn't get, doesn't get heard enough. Yeah, so the, the off, thank you for that question. This is a great discussion. I, I appreciate it. So the, um, the, the GAO, the General Accounting Office in the United States, did a, a, a study a couple of years ago trying to gauge the, the difference in cost for the U.S. Um, deploying some of its own troops as opposed to the UN, uh, the UN's peacekeeping mission in Central Africa. Anyway, it's a long way of saying that U.S. deployments cost eight to ten times more than UN deployments. And if you look at the budgets for Iraq and Afghanistan, it's many, many more times than 10 times. <laughs> um, the, UN, the whole UN peacekeeping budget is minuscule compared to what the US, I mean, the, we're, ta we're talking trillions of dollars um, of US dollars spent on Iraq and Afghanistan compared to, you know, well, the U.S. is paying $1.2 billion a year right now, which is the same uh, price as one B-2 bomber, one airplane, um, a big fancy airplane in the U.S. fleet, but still one of them. Um, so uh, when we're comparing costs, peacekeeping is, is a drop in the bucket compared to um, the U.S.'s um, involvement with NATO. So running moving back to what Peggy was just saying and then also this question from John Foster um, so why is Canada helping NATO um, more than the UN uh, it, it's interesting it's a it's and I think Peggy answered that question quite well I, I just I I'm always surprised that Canada has moved out of peacekeeping so quickly because of Lester Pearson and I mean, gosh, that's, you guys are the ones who, came, you know, the part of the institutionalization of peacekeeping came directly from Canada. Um, and so the rest of the world is benefiting now from Canada's efforts early on. But, um, but I, I guess after that experience in, in between, you know, between the three big ones, Somalia, Rwanda, um, Bosnia, one after the other in the early 1990s, Canada, Canada and all of the, the Western, um, the previously Western contributors left peacekeeping and they really haven't gotten back in, but who is moving in full force right now is China. So if you're interested in democratization, as China ascends in UN peacekeeping, right, China's the second largest troop con contributor, they pledge to um, contribute the most troops. Um, China is, is poised to take over the Department of Peace Operations the next time there's a shift. That France has had it for a long time, but China is moving in on that scene right now. And so you can bet that if we look into the future of peacekeeping, uh, the, all of those mandates that are pushing for democratic institutions, even if they haven't completely implemented those mandates, 
probably that part of the mandate is going to fall by the wayside, right? So pushing for dem democracy and elections and human rights, those dimensions of UN peacekeeping missions, I don't know if we're going to see that so much as we move into the future. Thank you, thank, thank you very much for that. And that harkens back, of course, to a point that um, that uh, that Jean Marie Gehano made, and that was that it, because because he had just that concern, he hoped that the focus could very much be on this building. Not you don't have to call it democratization; you can do it in a different way. But building trust, building trust between governments and and their publics, and and some of these uh, values, these important objectives, human rights protection. Uh, can can be worked in, but in a in a in a more indirect way. And yes, thank you. I I I was hesitating. John Foster, who I know well, it was because the question was focused so directly on Canada. Is Canada in danger of hypocrisy? On the one hand, peacekeeping is a worthy activity, much in Africa. On the other hand, Canada, U.S., NATO have conducted one war after another themselves, um, and the the destructive effect that has had in the recipient countries. So I think we've got at that. We've sort of got at that indirectly a little bit, uh, and uh, th but that is some. I don't know if either of you want to comment on that. Not necessarily Canada, but you know, Western countries. I mean, one could say great powers, and Richard has addressed that. But if either of you wanted to add anything, add anything to that, just before going to that, however, um, uh, you know, whenever the example of Bosnia, the great failures, is given. Uh, one of the things that I say when I talk to Canadian military establishment is the, the exact wrong lesson was learned from, uh, from, from uh, Bosnia. The, the UN, Amprafor, deployed in the context of a war, and NATO deployed in the con heavily, as, heavily armed as any mission could ever be, deployed in the context of a peace agreement. So, you know, I would say the, that's the overriding lesson, not that NATO, NATO somehow does, that, does this better. And of course, as you've pointed out, Lise, there's lots of evidence that uh, that the straight up military interventions and Richard mentioned as well don't work. But anyway, um, going back to the question about the hypocrisy, I guess I don't know if uh, Richard, you want to add anything there. You see that up close, I guess every every single day in New York. Oh uh, well, yeah, and I, I'm I'm married to a Canadian, so I, I know about uh, the, the natural Canadian tendency to keep on focusing on one's own failings. <laughs> but look, let me, two, two points, because I, uh, I'm afraid I have to jump off in a couple of minutes. Um, firstly, I, I would just like to push back a little on Lee's. We finally found a source of disagreement. I think, um, I, I, th I think this stuff about China taking over peacekeeping is frankly overrated at the moment. China is the biggest contributor of peacekeepers amongst the P5, but it's actually only roughly at the same level as Ghana. It's the 10th biggest um, contributor of peacekeepers um, overall. We're not talking about Ghana's global takeover. Um, I also think that, uh, frankly, that the Chinese, who lost a bunch of personnel in South Sudan and Mali in 2016, actually share some of the concerns that the Canadian military have. Um, the Chinese were, I mean, they were very gung-ho about their increasing investments in peacekeeping up until that point. But when they started to lose people, um, we saw quite a change in their approach. And what China keeps on emphasizing at the moment is that it wants to do more to improve the security of peacekeepers, avoid fatalities. You know, but Beijing is more cautious than we sometimes recognize. But that, that's an argument that I made in the, the Brookings paper, which um, uh, the link was circulated uh, a little earlier. Um, just quickly on NATO countries, I mean, I was involved in these debates a lot in the UK and other European capitals a while ago. I think that the Europeans, although they still don't love the UN, have changed direction a bit um, because they have seen that the UN mission in Mali is actually in Europe's strategic backyard and making that mission work is in Europe's interest. So you've had countries like the Netherlands, um, the Nordics, Germany sending peacekeepers to Mali. Uh, the UK is about to send a reconnaissance, um, uh, quite an, actually quite a significant reconnaissance presence to Mali. So the European NATO countries are going in a different direction to um, uh, to Canada. But um, yeah, whereas uh, the Europeans have the, the challenge of being close to Mali, uh, you have a different southern neighbor, um, which I don't think you can deal with through UN peacekeeping. Um, so geography matters. Uh, 
the Canadians who went to Mali were good. Um, the UN would like to see more Canadians. Um, but I do appreciate this is a difficult debate. Uh, lastly, on COVID, uh, you asked, Peggy, if uh, the UN had actually helped deal with COVID disinformation. Yes, and actually in places like CAR, in the capital, you know, the UN played an important role also in terms of providing medical support, um, in terms of ensuring that food convoys were getting into CAR because the pandemic actually held up food supplies to the capital. So the UN played a proactive role in dealing with, with some of the challenges arising from COVID too. Um, I'm sorry I have to jump off, but I have to go straight into another Zoom. So uh, with that, I, I'd like to thank everyone for a great conversation. And I would like to thank you very much. And that's a you know ending on a positive note with respect to the role of the UN uh, in, in, in helping countries address COVID. The UN mission helping countries address COVID, I think is the perfect spot for all of us to end on. And I would just note that some of these very tough issues that we've discussed today will be addressed uh, in panel two, uh, will be addressed further in panel two, which will be at 7 p.m. on Monday, this coming Monday evening. And with that, I thank you all. I thank our panelists and I thank our audience very, very much. Good day. Thank you.